thank you for joining today. We will begin the program soon. Thank you for joining us today. Please enjoy the event. Welcome everyone. We are so pleased you could join us today. I'm Mark Zuckerman, president of the Century Foundation. For those of you not familiar with the Century Foundation, we are a progressive independent think tank that conducts research, develops solutions, and drives policy change to make people's lives better. We pursue economic, racial, gender, and disability equity in education, healthcare, and work, and promote U.S. foreign policy that fosters international cooperation, peace, and security. I am thrilled to welcome today Thanasi Cabanis, Director of Century International. Today, we're making the publication of a new Century International book, Broken Bonds, The Existential Crisis of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, 2013 to 22. The book gives us new understanding of the Muslim Brotherhood, which will help policymakers, researchers, and anyone interested in Islamist and uh, Egyptian politics. The authors will share their insights about Islamist politics, extremist mobilization, and the most effective way to manage these extremist threats. In the next hour, you will hear about the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood's swift rise and dramatic fall and what's happened to the Brotherhood over the last de decade of exile and repression. With that, Thanasi, I'll turn it over to you and congratulations on this great book. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for your support for this fantastic work. I'm really proud today uh, to be moderating a panel by three of the smartest uh, researchers into the Brotherhood that I've worked on, uh, that I've worked with, excuse me, and with uh, Elizabeth Nugent, who's a professor of political science at Princeton University uh, and an expert on the Brotherhood, uh, who's going to be a, a sort of referee and respondent to the uh, to the work that went into this book. Uh, so this is uh, Broken Bonds. It came out last week, uh, and it marks a kind of different look 
at the Brotherhood. Uh, the three authors uh, who, who make up our panel today, uh, Noha Ezat, Abdurrahman Ayash, and Ahmed Afifi, are all, uh, I would call them 20 somethings. They might have, you know, one or two of them might have just crossed 30. Uh, but these are people who uh, grew up uh, during a, a late phase of the Muslim Brotherhood, during the period of Egypt's uh, Tahrir Square Revolution, and then during the really traumatic period that followed the 2013 coup. Uh, there was a massacre, a thousand people killed in one day in August 2013. Since then, the Brotherhood has been scattered across the world. Uh, and what these uh, three authors have done is they have charted the story of what's actually happened to the organization during this last decade. How has it fared in exile? What has happened to its ideology and beliefs? What has happened to its membership? And really importantly, they're asking some of the questions that come up all the time for policymakers. Is the Muslim Brotherhood the engine of extremism, of jihadism, of terrorist violence? Does repression, as we've seen, uh, to unprecedented lengths in, in Egypt in the last decade, does repression increase the violence uh, and, and uh, extremism of its targets? Uh, will the Brotherhood be erased from public life or will it come back? Uh, why, uh, why does it matter? Why does the Brotherhood matter? And finally, what, if anything, has the Brotherhood learned from its own mistakes in power uh, and its mistakes in, in the decades since? Uh, so we're going we're gonna to hear a lot about these, uh, these questions with a lot of texture and nuance from the authors and, and from uh, uh, Liz. And uh, I'm going uh, to start by, by trying to go with some of the big questions first and then get into some of the more narrow specifics uh, of the Brotherhood. And I'm going to try and have today's conversation proceed like a conversation. So we're not going to do long presentations. We're going to have short, uh, short interactive answers uh, from our panelists. And just to note, uh, this session is being recorded and live streamed. If you'd like to submit a question for the panelists, please do so using the Q&A feature. Uh, and there will be a recording of the event posted after the fact. Uh, so uh, let's start with, with you, Amr. Um, what are the most important misconceptions that policymakers have about the Brotherhood? And what have you tried to do in this book to dispel those misconceptions? Thank you so much, Thanas. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, there are two uh, misconceptions that, are, that I'm going to talk, uh, talk about, and I hate to start such a thoughtful conversation uh, with reference to Ted Cruz, but Ted Cruz on the Hill has been one of the leading voices for uh, designating the Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. What we try to do in the book um, is, make, is, is make the case that um, Part of what we try to do is make the case that the Brotherhood is not a terrorist organization. And we start with, and we engage with one of the toughest bits of this, which is thinking and working on uh, the post-2013 insurgencies that happened. There was that about crackdown that you mentioned, a thousand people were killed for one day. And in the in, in, for a couple of years after that, we started seeing that some members, um, uh, fringe groups of members engaged in uh, what we uh, think of or what they call as selective violence or retributive violence against officers who had killed their best friends, their family and stuff like that, right? And th there's one way, to think about this as like these are angry Muslim men who are motivated by religion, who are motivated by ide ideology that just seize the opportunity to pick up arms and go after these people, right? And we think that that's not a nuanced way to do it, to do what we have found to conducting uh, tens of interviews with, with uh, over courses over a course of two years and in six different countries with these with these members is you start understanding a lot more about the dynamics that happened. These are a group of people whose friends and family members, whose parents were killed, were exiled, and who were at, who were in an organization that at the moment lacked a coherent strategy and in a state um, that um, where there was no accountability for any of the violations that happened, right? So there, when, when we think of terrorism, we all typically think of an overarching uh, religious or ideological motivation, but digging, digging deep, we find that there was a, people were not motivated by ideology, um, rather that context defined a lot of this. The yeah. other um, misconception- just to, just to put a, put a, a frame around this, uh, 
one of the big problems with the policy discourse and the academic discourse around the Brotherhood is a lot of the work, in my view, is either preoccupied with defending and apologizing for this group or demonizing them and sort of painting them as the parent of Al Qaeda and ISIS and every like bad Islamic group that ever existed. And for me, the, the, the interesting questions lie in actually descriptively trying to understand what this group is and does. There, there have been uh, 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 like many bad actors that have come out of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, over the years and a study of the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't have to either defend those bad actions, nor does it have to sort of defend all Islam as a as a framework for politics. Um, and I think what you've done in this book that's so important is you've actually done the descriptive work of what did the young members and the leadership of the group do during and after the, the, the coup in 2013. And so we actually have a, a frame of reference. So if we're going to talk about whether the group should be designated as a terrorist group or not, which we're going to talk about a little later in the session, the first thing you need to know is what do they actually say and do? Um, and that record is, is something you can't find in a lot of places, but you can you can find it in, in this research. Well, absolutely. And um, we in our interviews, we talk to young members, we talk to senior leaders, and we track looking at uh, either documents the Brotherhood produced or the lived experiences of these leaders and discussions that were happening on the ground, the discussions that were happening on exile, on how these issues were debated, and what the dynamism looked like between uh, a cohort of youth who were on the street and, uh, and the leadership that was trying to catch up to them. Uh, the other misconception that I think is relevant to both U.S. Uh, policymakers and also to policymakers in Egypt is that the Muslim Brotherhood can be exiled or imprisoned away. In our book, we make we note that the conditions that led to the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and their persistence is not necessarily because they fool everyone with religious ideology or they motivate a type of religious sentiment in, in their median Egyptian, but because the politics is not pluralist and their presence has led for a type of, they have con like resembled a type of oppositional politics or created a space or maintained the space for oppositional politics um, in the last, since, since the inception of uh, the modern state in Egypt or even a little bit before that, that continues to give them grounds and, um, and and pub and uh, space within the Egyptian public. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, Noah, I want to turn to you. Um, you argue in this in this book and in your research that uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood has been misunderstood. That people thought of it as a mass popular organization, when in reality it was something something else, something smaller and an elite. Uh, small organization. So can you explain uh, is, is that, that the Brotherhood was just never as big uh, or as popular as analysts and even the Brotherhood's own leaders believed it to be? Uh, I think one of the main misconceptions amongst some uh, policymakers in Western countries and even probably amongst some senior members of the Muslim Brotherhood was that they conflated the religious influence of the group with its political power. And political power in Egypt is rather fluid, like successive regimes have been able to sort of reshuffle grand social organizations like the Socialist Union in the 1960s or the National Democratic Party of uh, Mubarak. But many times this was carried out by propagating a very fluid definition of nationalism and the Brotherhood basically could only cope with the regime by itself also propagating a very fluid definition of religiosity, like committed social and political organization and clear-cut ideologies are weak in Egypt. They, they, they have always had a very limited following in Egypt. So the two grand political organizations have been usually propagated by the regime and the Islamists by, by sort of propagating very um, loose ide ide ideologies to command the street. And those have proven time and again to be easily uh, unraveled. Like the, the, the way we've seen the Socialist Union unraveled in the, in, the, in the 1970s, the way we've seen Mubarak's National Democratic Party unraveled in uh, the late 2000s, I, th I think this was the main error that the Brotherhood fell in. They really never had a clear-cut political ideology. It was mostly the social activities, the charity, the, the, the student movements, generation after generation. And this was something they assumed would be a guaranteed vote at the ballot box. If they were the harbinger of the Islamic resurgence, that means that if the vast majority of Egyptians have become religious, this means that they would be easily the, the majority party. But this turned out to be not the case. 
and it turns out that the Brotherhood was mainly designed as a social organization, but by design, it's not a political party. It, it, it lacks a clear-cut political mission. And this is something people in the street quickly sensed after 2011 and 2012. And added to that is the fact that they, they themselves neglected the political center by, by trying to expand. Yes, they were a big organization, but they managed to do this swiftly in the 1990s and the early 2000s by expanding at the margins of the society where the state was mostly absent. And this led to the fact that their power was rather curtailed in the central institutions like syndicates, like universities. When the government started cracking down on them in those central institutions in the 1990s, they sort of withdrew and partially depoliticized to protect the social organization. So time and again, the social was the priority, not the political. So that, and, 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 and no, I just want to follow up on that because to me, this, I mean, I've been following the Brotherhood for a long time, and yet this was a, uh, this, your analysis of this shifted my understanding of what I had already seen, right? So, you know, in looking back at, at, at history, I often have made this mistake, and I think others have too, we see you know, uh, prayer leaders in front of a crowd. We see brothers in front of, of, of you know, a very disciplined group of thousands of marchers, let's say, or, or in, in pre-revolutionary times when it was, you know, the brotherhood was the largest uh, group able to mobilize uh, uh, groups of people to face down the violence of the state or to protest against policies. And that gave me what I think turns out to be an incorrect impression that this is a grassroots movement. Right, that, that the Brotherhood represents some very large, deeply integrated into society uh, group of dedicated followers. And if I understand correctly, what you found in this, uh, in, in, through your interviews and your research was that actually, no, this was an elite membership organization whose most effective, what it was most effective at was serving the core membership, which was yes, dedicated, but a very small elite group. And these crowds that we saw were, I mean, explain the crowds. Were the, the like why why did we all, including I think the Brotherhood itself, get this mistaken notion that there were millions of people uh, ready to, to 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 follow and obey them? Uh, I think the Brotherhood, just like the regime, usually relied on some sort of foundational moments, like when when the prayer leaders face the crowds, it's like also Nasser facing the, 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 the crowds in the 1960s. Like there's always the, been this fluidity of commanding political power in Egypt by managing to mobilize the crowds easily. But, but time and again, the events proved that they were also dispersed very, uh, very easily. And most of the organizations that commanded the street in Egypt, whether on behalf of the regime or later on the Islamic movements, they usually managed to do so through, through fluid discourses. And most of the, crowds in the streets weren't really a grassroots movement in the in the same way we understand, for example, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, for instance. This was a really committed, grand grassroots social organization that unraveled quickly along the decades. But in Egypt, we've never had such a grassroots movement at all. It's it's usually been successive waves of mob mobilizing crowds. Thanks, uh, Noha. So Ayash, let me ask you, I mean, one, one of the reasons why people care about the Brotherhood is because of this question of radicalization, right? And I think, you know, we, we can complicate uh, that label and that, and that narrative, but ultimately a, re a reason why the group is important is because uh, correctly or incorrectly, it is perceived to be the umbrella of the most problematic, violent, groups uh, uh, that, that have risen out of the Islamic world in, in modern times. Um, so can you tell us uh, uh, what, um, what we, what, you know, what we've learned about radicalization si uh, since, especially since the Brotherhood's year in power, when it had, I guess, the, 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 the peak uh, of its influence when Mohamed Morsi was president of Egypt, and for a brief moment, the Brotherhood had the levers of a powerful modern state at its disposal. Uh, what, what do you take away as the lessons about, uh, about radicalization more broadly and the Muslim Brotherhood's trajectory with regards to radicalization? Right. Thank you so much, Tanethi, and, and thanks for the question, actually. Uh, actually, one of my hopes with writing this book was to move on from thinking of violence as a manifestation of ideological commitments. And, and the Muslim brother. And, and this thinking is not only wrong, but has led also to less than interesting strains of, of questions. Uh, what we need to do is to situate the issues of violence or the issue of violence within the historical and, and political context. 
and 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 move on from thinking of the Ikhwan as inherently exceptional in any way. Historically, yeah, the Brotherhood emerged within the context of, of the national liberation movement in, in, in Egypt, uh, within the imperial and colonial state at the time, and like many other actors, organized and otherwise, on the ground, they were dissidents who fought for national liberation. And, and they even worked with the military, uh, with the Egyptian military in the 1948 war in Palestine. And, and in the 40s, even after, uh, shortly after Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the movement, founded the special apparatus, or Tanzim al-Sirri, as, as we say in Arabic, or Tanzim al-Khas. Let, let's, jump, let's jump forward to 2014, Ayash, because, you know, <laughs> two minutes to to address this cr critical uh, idea. I, I thought that <laughs> you'd do that, of course. But what, what I want to say is that many actually have been thinking about the Muslim Brotherhood as a hotbed bid for terrorism. What we, we are trying to say is that the Muslim Brotherhood, although yeah, some members actually have left the Muslim Brotherhood to join militant groups, but the, the, the many more ex-members have gone on to lead the independence movement in uh, 52, the, 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 the uh, even uh, April 6th movement uh, in, in uh, the early 2000s and Kifaya movement, and even the Egyptian uh, revolution of 2011, and jumping to, uh, to 2014. Our research shows that when the organization is strong, violent offshoots are less likely to emerge. And, and the weak ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, which we detailed, uh, or we describe in detail in, in our book, is compensated for by the strength of the Tanzim, of the organization. And b because the, 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 the it, I mean, and I, now well, it's good at bureaucracy the, and bad at ideas. Is that, is that a way of putting it? That, that, that's a very good way to put it. Yes. And, and the, the, I, I have to say, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood, the numbers of the members are estimated to be a million uh, members in, in Egypt, maybe less than that, maybe more. But I mean, imagine if a million man organization turned violent. I mean, their political reality would have looked much more different than it did uh, uh, than it did and uh, then or, or than it, it does today, actually. So w w what what we say is that the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, an incubator and and uh, for, for opposition in Egypt for a very long time that produced uh, political cadres and political activists. Um, so, some of them, yes, joined the, the, uh, the, the uh, militant or a terrorist organization, but this has less to do that with ideology than other contexts. Thanks. So Liz, I want you to help, help, help us think about how outsiders look at and understand this group. Um, can you can you give us a little perspective on how uh, uh, both policymakers and academics view the Brotherhood, and then what's your take on on you know how much that those views are in need of correction or adjustment? Yeah, thanks so much uh, for the question, for the invitation, um, and just a quick congratulations to the authors because I think. Um, this book is a really important documentation of what's happened within the Brotherhood, but it also has some really interesting, you know, as you mentioned, Tana, uh, Tanasi, that some interesting theoretical contributions for not only reframing the Brotherhood, but maybe thinking about Islamists more generally. Um, so, you know, I think Ahmed and Ayash and Noah have all kind of alluded to some of the stereotypes that unfortunately both academics, <laughs> very intelligent academics, um, in other ways, uh, and policymakers often refer to, right? So this obsession with ideology, you know, this obsession with radicalization, one of the most important takeaways of the book for me that I think other people, you know, would, would benefit from is this idea that the Muslim Brotherhood is a product of its national context, right? And the important developments that are documented in this book um, were conditioned essentially by that upbringing. So the, the authors do a great job of building on um, some superb work by uh, Dr. Khalil al -Anani that demonstrates, right, the brotherhood develops and thrives under decades of authoritarian governance. Um, this structured the actual structure of the organization, right? It closed in on itself. It was also quite diffuse, you know, depending on kind of the moment of repression. Um, 
the authors of this book show very well how the ideology is quite malleable, depending on what the situation is repressively. Um, and it also led to what kind of leadership was prioritized and promoted within the group. Um, so I think, you know, for me, what was really convincing about this argument was this idea of continuity. What sustained the brotherhood um, before coming to power then contributed to its inability to govern effectively in 2012 and is contributing to these three crises that they do a fantastic job of outlining in the book, right? The identity crisis, the legitimacy crisis, and the membership crisis. Um, I think in so many words, you know, maybe the main takeaway is that what the brotherhood is good at is survival, which has a couple of, of, th of implications, right, that are important for both academics and, and policymakers. Um, I think it, you know, it, it puts into context why it was difficult for this kind of organization to govern and to do so so quickly. Um, I think it puts into context this idea that, you know, if survival is your goal, it's difficult to take care of such a large organization. And maybe it's not a million people, but to take care of all these people in crisis, it's quite difficult. Um, and I think, you know, there's potentially one uh, other important implication that I think Amr um, mentioned, right? The Brotherhood, again, is good at survival, which means that they're likely going to get through this terribly disruptive and extremely painful and unprecedented repressive period in some capacity, right? Even if that's only with a small core group um, of members and leadership, even if that's only an exile outside of the country. Um, but I think, you know, in 2013, there were a lot of these like death of Islamism, you know, Islamism will never play a big role in the Middle East again or, or anywhere else, right? And I think likely, you know, the Brotherhood is going to be an important player in Egyptian politics in the future, whether that's under the current highly repressive regime of LCC or if, or in any kind of, uh, you know, more liberalized democratic context, you know, the ideas, the structure, um, and the leadership, right? I mean, these things might not work well during normal periods uh, of governance, but they do work well under crisis and they're designed to do so. So, I mean, I, and I, I wanna, as a follow-up, I mean, I ask you, because I'm, I'm always interested in the policy implications of, of our work. Um, and it seems to me like maybe one read of this is that we accorded way too much importance to the, like to the content of the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, uh, Islamist program and not enough to its uh, importance just by being an effective organization. So we study things like what they say about, uh, you know, the role of women or minorities or Christians, or, you know, are they inciting jihad or are they anti-Semitic? And it turns out these all these things, they, they might depart very little from like general Egyptian views on all these things. So if their views are problematic, they're problematic in the way of like general Egyptian politics. And in fact, what distinguishes them is their organizational persistence, not their idea content. Um, and if that's true, and that's kind of a new a new framework, uh, certainly for me to think about the, the Brotherhood, it's like at the, at, the, at the same time, it's deflationary, uh, it sort of pops the bubble of like their big bad ideas. And on the other hand, it says like, oh, and they're, they're probably going to keep being around and they're going to keep being terrible and ineffective in the same ways over and over, right? Like rigid authoritarian, bad at decision making, not not adapting to, to to external stimuli and stuff. Like these are built into why they survive and also why they are bad at governing. Is that is is, is that fair? And what's and what's the implication like for a U.S. policymaker of this uh, rev revelation or this analysis? Yeah, I mean, one thing that the book does very well is that you you often hear, you know, in academic texts and even, you know, in, in public writing about the Brotherhood, about different generations within the organization. Um, the authors of this book do a great job of, of delineating kind of what group was in power in 2013 and 2012. And then there's a lot of infighting, uh, which is hard to follow, but not because of, of the writing, it's just hard to follow because there's a lot of infighting over the last 10 years. Um, I think what's very interesting is some of these youth generations and it's, you know, youth by the World Bank standards. So, you know, 35 or something. <laughs> Under 40. Exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, 
these these folks who have left the brotherhood haven't left all of it behind, right? I mean, there are certain aspects of the ideology that obviously still very much resonate with them. Um, I think a lot of their, or my take on on reading this book was that much of the the disappointment with the group had to do with its rigid hierarchy, um, its inability to adapt, some of these organizational issues. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, in thinking as a policymaker, there may be a place to engage with some of these younger generations who seem to be a bit more, not even progressive necessarily in terms of ideology, although they often are. Um, they're just, you know, they're better socialized with other parts of the Egyptian political scene. They, you know, kind of came up together on these university campuses. They know each other. They're, they understand, you know, the importance of pluralism and cooperation. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, to, to answer your question, I think the organizational uh, issues were very real. And I think they are of a specific generation as the authors do a great job of, of pointing out, but it's hard to stay in an organization, right? That has that so firmly baked into itself if you are trying to change it from the inside. So thanks, um, Liz. Um, Noah, I wanna to turn to you now to, to, to get into the story that you've woven together here. Uh, so we've just been talking about the sort of big framing ideas. Um, but some of the most interesting contributions of your research are to just tell us like what actually happened. Um, so what happened to all the, uh, all, all, all the Brotherhood members inside Egypt since the 2013 crackdown? What's become of the, of the Egyptian Brotherhood inside Egypt? Uh, okay, so uh, I guess the membership, the, the, the rank and fight, this was the only aspect of the organization that was really organized as a, as, a, as a social movement and it led the crowds basically as we said uh, a few moments ago one could say that the organization was suddenly turned inwards face to face with its own internal rifts it had to cater for all the hundreds of victims after the massacres and imprisonments and the exile and this was a huge political and social task and it was also a huge economic task given that much of its economic activities were, were curtailed, many of its assets were seized. So the rent distribution inside the organization was much more limited than it used to be and of course most of those members are committed, they are ideologically committed but in all circumstances, when the assets available for an organization to give benefits to its members is under strain, you, you can you can see the impact. You can you can see how rifts could uh, could take place. I would say that the members were mainly divided into two groups: the elders who are who ha who had seen the repression in the 1960s. They know how it how it they know what what repression means, and they were far sighted enough. I would I would have to say to believe that violence would still not work, and that they know this is a phase that happened before, and it's happening again, and it's going to pass. And those are the ones who exercise some sort of an authoritarian politics inside the organization to keep the youth from going to violence, to keep them from being attracted to the HAC, which adopted a much more radical and, 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 and violent approach. This, of course, was not popular with, with, with some younger members who were the first to be dealing with this kind of repression and, and, and violence. And given the fluidity of violence in the region after the emergence of some violent groups in, 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 in Syria and in, in Libya, it was natural that some of them got attracted to uh, those, uh, those, those kinds of, of movements that that, that the elders try to exercise this authoritarian politics to keep the membership intact, to keep the organization intact as much as possible. One could say that this is a paradigm that has its merits and it, it, it's historically foreseeing, but it was still problematic because it turned away many uh, young members. They accused the leadership, of course, of being uh, authoritarian. And all in all, I would say that the capacity of the, of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood up to this very moment for commanding crowds and mobilizing people has been largely limited. They only have whatever remains of the core organization itself. Those who are committed, many of them are suffering from exile, from prison, from... So can, can, can I, can I re-ask that in a much more basic way? I mean, that's, that's, that's great, compelling analysis, but I just wanna, for a minute, get a check-in on, so, you know, pre-2013, you had maybe a million Muslim Brotherhood members in Egypt. It's a very hierarchical organization. You have rank and file members, you have youth, you have charity work, you have uh, uh, religious work. They're very visible, right? And they, they, they appear in various public spaces as an organized and large 
group of people doing Muslim Brotherhood things. Okay, uh, uh, I'm curious what has become of so that community of a million people. Are they still in Egypt and have resigned from the Brotherhood? Are they just waiting to be, you know, reactivated to a meeting when the group becomes re-legalized? Like, just on that level, what has become of this very, like, you know, effective, large, pyramidal organization that used to be very much in evidence and in, in not just political, but in in all all kinds of parts of public life in Egypt? Uh, okay, g- given that it wasn't designed to be a political party, one would say that. Ex- exterminating it from the uh, political arena means that most of its members haven't really been in, in, in exile or arrested or killed. You can't really kill one million people or, or, or arrest them. Most of those arrested and put into exile and those who had been victims to uh, violence are mostly the consequential members who are who are very well known who are who are in command most of the average members I would say they are they they mostly are still in Egypt carrying out their daily social Act, act, activities as they do, much of their publicly, like much, much of their activities, which which had an impact in the public sphere, of course, have been curtailed. They don't organize student activities anymore. They don't organize charity anymore, at least not not overtly, not in the same large scale um, way they used to do before uh, 2013. But I would say the majority are, are, are still there. They have been depoliticized. But partly this was already done before 2013 because this is what the organization itself did to its to to to, to those members pre-2011. So I guess they're still there as 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 a social group, but the the, the structure of the of the, of the of the organization has been rather broken by the inner rifts. So I think when if if the brother if the brother if the brotherhood is back at any mo- moment in time, it would be really a struggle for them to know whose call are they gonna listen to the, 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 this this faction or that. So, and, and Ayash, I wanted to ask you to sort of answer the same question about the brotherhood in exile, but I want to add another layer to that question, um, which you or or others can address. Um, but thinking about what Noah just said um, and, and what, what you've written, uh, it seems like the most influential and dynamic thinkers that come out of the brotherhood um, in this generation have largely rejected the thinking and approach of the of the brotherhood's senior leadership and and officials so like you know in an earlier era the the most active creative thinkers out of the brotherhood were extremists in the vein of Sayyid Qutb right so they left the brotherhood to become something more extreme now i'm wondering if if if, if this is right the most interesting and dynamic and influential thinkers have rejected the rigidity of the brotherhood have even rejected the slogan islam is the solution and have gone off into you know secular political directions into media work into uh in some cases that we know of have left religion entirely or have you know become depoliticized or have really separated their politics from their religion i'm wondering if, if it, like how you assess so maybe you could talk about brotherhood in exile and what's become of it but maybe you can also touch on this question of uh has the failure of the brotherhood's approach generated in in the rejection of it by its own membership a, a new and different way of thinking about politics oh yes you're muted sorry yeah uh, per- first, I'd like yeah, to agree with Noham and, and uh, absolutely the failures of the Muslim Brotherhood on strategy and on organization yeah, has led many uh, of, of the members, whether in Egypt or in exile, to uh, be indifferent to politics. Uh, many of them, as you, as you noted, uh, has lost their, uh, their relation with religion. Um, and and they, they, they started thinking of, uh, of other ways to, uh, to live their, their lives. I mean, for, for most of, or for, for many, I have to say, of, of the Muslim Brotherhood members, the organization provided, again, a social incubator. They, they, they didn't know anything outside this organization. So when the organization uh, get, got dissolved or, or got hit hard, yeah, they, 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 they weren't able to benefit from, from being members in, in this organization. And, and that's why they had to find other uh, alternatives, whether politically or or religiously, uh, on on the question, uh, and I also I want to reiterate what Noah 
uh, had said about about the the, uh, the presence of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, uh, many leaders or several leaders and, and members have confirmed that the majority or the vast majority of the Muslim Brotherhood members are still in the country. Uh, uh, they are uh, yeah, they are waiting for the Muslim Brotherhood to come back for for a political opening, maybe. Uh, but of course, they 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 will need much more than the, the traditional uh, ways of, of mobilizing to, to, uh, to believe again in the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood. Outside Egypt or, or, uh, or in the exile, um, many members of the Muslim Brotherhood who, who left, they, they didn't have a lot of choices actually uh, in the countries uh, to travel to. Uh, they, uh, they, they fled to, to countries whose governments uh, were welcoming, uh, Turkey, for instance, or countries that they did not need visas uh, to, to go to. And, and uh, as an Egyptian passport holder, yeah, it's a difficult list. So uh, first people, uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when they had to leave, so they, they first left to Sudan, and many actually because they, didn't, they weren't able to obtain uh, identification or, or official documents, so they had to stay in Sudan for, for some time. People traveled to Malaysia, uh, people traveled to a lesser extent to Qatar, and, and to uh, some African countries like Kenya or European countries like the UK. But most of, of, of the members that I've met uh, decided to resettle later in Turkey uh, as the government provided them with uh, easy residence permits and, and a political cover. I, I want in, to, so. in exile, Ayash, are they, is the Brotherhood functioning like a, you know, does it have leadership and, and, and these sort of bureaucratic organs? That that have been that, that you've documented as being so important to the Brotherhood's persistence. Have those structures sort of survived or re regrouped in exile? Yes, yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. Of course, the internal uh, rifts affected uh, the, the speed and and the eff efficiency of, of this re regrouping. But after all, yes, they, they were able to regroup. What's what's important actually to note here is that yeah they, they resettled in other countries but they did not uh, abandon the uh, the Egyptian coast. I mean I mean most of them or, or the Brotherhood when they left Egypt they had maybe three uh, three objectives: getting members out and safe, and supporting the families of the victims, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, whether uh, the families of the prisoners or the families of the uh, the, the those who were killed. And of course, engaging in international advocacy. The Muslim Brotherhood tried to do uh, all, all this rather without a coherent strategy or, or inefficiently, uh, but they, they, uh, they, they did build media platforms, they did build political platforms at some point. And, and uh, lastly, they started to rethink their problems. Uh, by or after creating think tanks and uh, and after many of the young members started to study social sciences, public policy, public administration, and and to look at the brotherhood problems in 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 a, in a different uh, or from a different scope, I'd say. So what I want to come back in in the next round to the question of learning, uh, but let me ask uh, you, Ahmed, what's the discourse about violence? Um, and uh, both inside Egypt and in exile among the Brotherhood. What's the debate about whether to, whether to go for violent revolution or, or embrace the use of force as, as, as a way of, of, of uh, coming back to relevance? Yeah, I think the question of violence has largely been settled for the better part of the last eight years or so, right? It's not like in the interviews I've conducted with tens of members, it's not something that came up, it's not something that they think of, it's not something that they're worried about, right? I think the state in a way has moved on as well. The way the people we talk to see it is that we're in a live, or, or, or the way I see it as well, and what we hope to show in the book is that the world we live in or the reality they see is not one in which they're debating uh, whether or not they're going to pick up arms, right? With the reality they live in is one in which there's tens of thousands of people who are exiled, who are refugees in countries they do not necessarily want to go back to. They want to go back home. Their relationship, they're traumatized. Their families are traumatized. Their relationship with their uh, with their country is strained. Their parents are in prison. Their friends are in prison. And the authoritarian politics is such as that they are their families not only being repressed. Uh, and behind bars, they're dying behind bars, but also the extent of the repressive, repressive apparatus in Egypt has uh, 
uh, extended its arms into where they are in Turkey and Egypt. And that's what they're trying to solve for, right? They're trying to understand. Uh, looks like you want to interject, sorry. Yeah, I just want to ask, uh, I mean, for our viewers especially, can you just give us a quick census of how many people, how many brothers, brother members have been killed, how many are in prison now, and how many are in exile? Because that's... Uh Absolutely, I can do my best. In terms of people who are who who are, who are killed, we know that um, in since like in 2013 in Rabah, uh, there was the Rabah massacre, which according to Human Rights Watch claimed upwards of 800 lives. But in different parts of the country, not only in Cairo, there were many Rabahs. Right, there was a mini Rabah in Alexandria, there was a mini Rabah in Tonta, there was a mini Rabah in Swiss. There were different Rabahs around the country. Right, so where in terms of people who were killed at that moment, and Human Rights Watch also documented over 100 people being extrajudicially killed people were killed in different ways so like we're upwards of a thousand people who have been who were who just like killed by arms by by the egyptian state in terms of people who are uh in terms of the number of political detainees there's uh upward there's around sixty thousand political prisoners and this number was published by the uh by Gamal Aid's organization 60, network for, 60, political prisoners. 60 000 political prisoners for u.s policy makers this like uh, the reference point that we put to this is that there's 60 000 political prisoners in egypt and around 400 in russia right so like the extent of the repressive state in, in 400 uh, not 400 000. Just four hundred, yes, just four hundred, just four hundred, right? Um, so that, that's like one floor or half a floor of one prison in bed right and, now, right? And, and the exile population is is about how big? And, and I just want to say one more thing about uh, about prison, and, and so in addition, like. To the large number of prisoners, it's not like they're left there alone. They're left there and they're dying, right? Medical negligence in prison in Egypt claims about one person every four days. At one point, this person's name was Shadi Habash. At four days later, that person's name was Muhammad Mursi, right? And I think this speaks to the fact that um, both in exile and within these prisons, the discussions that are happening now is, well, at some point in 2013, Sisi's uh, wrath or the wrath of the Egyptian state at the time, the wrath of the security forces at the time, was directed towards the Muslim Brotherhood. Ten years later, we're in a situation in which the um, the entirety of the political spectrum, right, from your Muslim Brotherhood all the way to your revolutionary socialists, are affected and are cracked down by the same regime, using the same tactics, using the same types of officers, right? That's that's what members are trying to solve for. That's what they're trying to talk. That's what they're talking about, and that's the hurdle they're trying to jump. When CC um, called for a national dialogue last April. There were a bunch of which did not happen, probably won't happen. Um, there were a bunch of national dialogues that happened in exile as well, right? And I was privileged enough to attend some of them. And in those, you have people from different ends of the political spectrum discussing how can we come together, right? How do we move on from the Muhammad Mahmoud? How do we move on from the Rabahs and actually start engaging a lot more productively? I think where the Brotherhood now internally is, they're poised for a third revival in their history, at where if they are, if 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 they're able to revitalize and be creative about the ideas, they might be able to save the organization and actually have it cater for their members. Whether if we assume worst case scenario and that they do not change at all and everything stays the same, they are at a place now where they are amenable to being socialized in very productive ways. In meetings they've had with leftists and liberal activists, they have expressed their willingness to quote unquote to apologize for their mistakes, to take to acknowledge the harm that they have done to society and acknowledge the harm that they have done to some of their own members themselves. A lot of the members we spoke with are as disenchanted by uh, the repressive regime in Egypt as they are their own leadership, and reckoning needs to happen both internally and externally. So, Liz, uh, is it possible? I mean, so it seems like the Egyptian state's approach is to just, through attrition, eventually make the Brotherhood not not matter. You know, like you know, if not, they can't kill all the members, just repress them. You know, ten years later, keep repressing them with this level of force with the idea that, you know, what Nasser did wrong was not repress them harder and longer. Um, is it possible to eventually uh, so, so, uh, so weaken the brotherhood that it ends up like, let's say, Syria's Muslim brotherhood, just, you know, too small, too weak, too deracinated to, to matter? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's certainly possible, but it's not probable for a couple of reasons. Um, 
you know, I, as Amr was just hinting at, I mean, the number of Brotherhood members and kind of ex-members adjacent uh, that are out of the country, in addition to those who are still in the country, but, you know, in hiding, it's it's quite large. Uh, my understanding is that the in Istanbul, where there's kind of a, a hub of, of Brotherhood and former Brotherhood exiles, there's potentially up to like 30,000 if you start to count like the families and, and kind of relatives. So that's, that's a large group. Um, I think again, also this um, idea, right? Both with brotherhood and former brotherhood of a long-term gradualist reformist politics, right? That incorporates Islam in some way that seems to not be going away either. So eliminating the organization wouldn't necessarily eliminate that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I think, I personally think from some of my own research that the Egyptian state's use of excessive force in first clearing the country of the brotherhood, but then turning to these other organizations and other parties, many of which Ahmed mentioned, was it had this unintended consequence of, of maybe humanizing the brotherhood in some ways. I mean, you see now human rights organizations have been taking up like leftist, secularist, and brotherhood cases across the board, right? In a way that I'm not sure happened before 2013. Um, and I think, you know, as all these groups have gone through similarly traumatizing experiences, it's it's potentially creating, you know, bonds that matter. Um, and then finally, you know, I think there is, even if sometimes it's, it's somewhat begrudgingly, um, an acceptance from other parts of the opposition that there's no democratic future in Egypt without the Brotherhood, right? Depending on which election you look at, between 30 to 40 percent of the Egyptian electorate is pretty okay with a lot of what the Brotherhood offers ideologically. Um, and there's a funny little anecdote in the book, which is supposed to, you know, the conversation between the prison guard and, and one of the um, younger detainees about how the Brotherhood has been very successful at, at doing things like, you know, it essentially is Islamizing Egyptian society. So people are praying um, at higher rates. People's wives are, are covered, right? I mean, that was kind of the punchline of the joke that they have Islamized society in a way that makes it difficult to think that you could fully erase what they represent, even if you, you know, got rid of the organization itself. And uh, just a reminder to our audience, you can post uh, questions in the YouTube chat um, and I will uh, be shown them and can ask them. So feel free to, to uh, put your questions there. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, Liz, uh, uh, following up on that, what about um, the question of terrorist designation, which seems to perennially come up, right? I mean, the Egyptian government has wanted, I think actually does uh, designate the Brotherhood as a, as a terrorist group. Uh, that seems to be an evergreen debate in London and Washington. Um, what's the uh, pr pros and cons of, of doing such a thing? Yeah, well, um, yeah, so my understanding- Or just cons, you don't have to give them pros. If you yeah, <laughs> I don't think there are any pros, but um, I think Egypt in 2014, or maybe even in 2013, labeled the Brotherhood a terrorist organization. Saudi Arabia and the UAE also label it a terrorist organization for obvious reasons, having to do with you know, ideological divides in this new era of Cold War, if we want to call it that. Um, Ted Cruz, as Ahmed mentioned, has brought this up, you know, I think as recently as last year, maybe, but uh, starting in 2015, Trump also, you know, uh, supporting his favorite dictator, um, talked quite a bit about that. Um, in Europe, my understanding is that there's been increasing scrutiny of the group. If you look at, you know, parliamentary organizations, websites, they often uh, have these formal inquiries into whether the Brotherhood is a terrorist organization, and they tend to come down on the side that they're not, right? They're doing much more things like education and, and service provision. Um, Austria, I think, has gotten the closest to labeling it a branch of a terrorist organization, but hasn't done so yet. Um, the drawbacks are many. I mean, I think, you know, we've talked quite a bit about the number of exiles and people applying for asylum claims. Um, there would be a lot of international headaches, right, uh, and financial headaches that would come along with this. Um, and I think whether or not, whether you disagree with the politics or not, right, these are undoubtedly human rights victims here. And so designating the group a terrorist organization would complicate it. Um, there's a really great piece from a couple of years back by Michelle Dunn and Andrew Miller. 
uh, from Carnegie that outlines, I think it's 10 points for why it would be very problematic for international diplomatic reasons um, that I found very convincing. Thank oh, you. Oh, and then I guess one last thing too, you know, Amur had um, alluded to this. I think in trying to understand the Brotherhood over the last 10 years, right, not to condone violence, but much of it has been defensive, right, or reactive. And I think to put the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood within its context, right, Egyptian politics right now is very repressive and generally very violent, right? So we need to think about it within that organ, within that structure, right? It's not um, just a group that's attacking the state. They're being attacked by the state as well. Right. And uh, so, no, I want to turn to you. I mean, it seems like, uh, I mean, my my view of this is that, yes, the Brotherhood reflects its context. The context is not democratic. The Brotherhood is going to be part of Egyptian politics for a long time to come, and it will not be a force for democracy any more than the military has been. Um, so with, you know, that's my view. Uh, with that, uh, with that framing, um, can you tell us, if anything, what is the Muslim Brotherhood learning at this stage in its, uh, you know, post Rabah exile and, uh, you know, attempt to maintain relevance in the face of, of so much uh, uh, repression and rejection? Uh, I think the Brotherhood has learned to, you know, you can say it, not much if your answer is like really not enough. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and say that. I think they were they were mostly engulfed by the trauma and the the internal rifts. But if some members or, or or some factions have learned something, they have learned it for pragmatic reasons. Like now they can better instrumentalize the discourse on human rights and democratization, and they know that they can still command a sizable chunk of any voting process, like 20 or 30 percent at least. Yani. So I think this is what they have learned, that they are trying to better instrumentalize the tools of the 21st century politics. Like it seems that they were stagnant. Sincerely like... or genuinely? <laughs> um, I can't really label it genuine or insincere. It's, it's, it's just an instrumental and pragmatic, whatever benefits the organization they're, they're gonna do. Maybe this would have the unintended effect of aiding democratization in Egypt or not. Maybe this would have the unintended effect of undermining how the state usually demonizes human rights activists as westernizes and, 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 and secular and so on. I think when the Brotherhood engages this phenomena of human rights activism, this might, might help in undermining the demonization of it. But whether the Brotherhood does this genuinely or not, of course, everyone has a definitive answer to this question given their position vis-a-vis -vis the Brotherhood. But for me, it's largely pragmatic. It's whatever serves the, 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 the organization they are gonna do. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I'm going to turn to Amma because these are our sort of closing questions. I always remember how all the secular activists uh, defended the Brotherhood so assiduously before the revolution and then how the Brotherhood so uh, merrily sold those same people down the river once they were in power. Um, that's my, again, my view. Um, and uh, in, the, in the aftermath, I see, you know, the Brotherhood is very happy once again to turn to the human rights community and to other, you know, other folks uh, uh, for sympathy. And I wonder, uh, you know, from what, you know, from what you've seen, is there, um, so two questions, and I mean these as hard questions. One, doesn't the Brotherhood to some extent deserve the, the resentment uh, or exclusion of like, you know, Egyptian freedom fighters <laughs> who were uh, uh, who found that the Brotherhood was not really interested in freedom once they had power, um, and 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 two, have you seen any evidence of a, of a real change of behavior among I don't mean rank and file young people, but among like senior Brotherhood types who are really the ones who own this bad judgment uh, uh, in the period since their fall from grace? All that in sixty seconds, please. So the first question is, do they uh, do, do, do they deserve what's happening? No. Um, so I'll just try to answer you quickly. Is it uh, are they asking for sympathy from folk? Is this all not genuine? There is an there is a politics of victimization that happens where and uh, I know we're talking about our book, but uh, Liz's book after repression is also really important in understanding the dynamics of polarization uh, amongst different groups and why and how that happens. I think there is a genuine 
uh, undertaking of human uh, of of human rights rhetoric of, and of human rights principles amongst uh, Muslim Brotherhood rank and fire, uh, rank, rank and file, and amongst some of the senior leaders as well, have some of the senior leaders internalize some of the the lessons that happened. 100%. Some of the senior leader, leaders we spoke with said verbatim, this is, includes uh, uh, people like Ibrahim Munir, who was the general uh, guide before he passed away, or acting general guide, where he said verbatim, like, we did not know how to, 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 to rule the country, we should not have gone into it. The context was as such that we did. Uh, but we we were not supposed to, right? Other senior leaders we spoke to said we uh, we didn't have enough knowledge on how to run a country, and we probably shouldn't have, right? They were put like whether it was right or wrong, or whatever happened. How like they can defend their own positions. That's not what we're doing. That's not what I'm answering for. But I think there has been some learning, and there's also a, a group within the Brotherhood that thinks that they are the righteous victims of everything wrong that happens in the world, and that they don't deserve this. But that also happens. That's also the case of like liberals in Egypt and leftists in Egypt who feel that they are victimized by everything and everyone. Right. That's just the nature of what also, it's a, it's a predominantly non-democratic political culture. That's the you know the, the context is and that transcends the brotherhood now I, I hate to stop you but we're about out of time um so i'm gonna wrap up the session I, I think we have a lot more to cover but we'll just have to leave it there uh so this is the book broken bonds it's fantastic it's actually a fun read there's uh, i won't tell you what it says but there's a great anecdote about an inquisition committee that was investigating a makluba uh, recipe that had had the the, the wrong ingredients um, and other other similar insider tidbits that reveal a lot about the the um, the culture of the brotherhood uh, uh, since 2013. Uh, so we've been talking today with Amir Al Afifi, Noha Azat, and Abdurrahman Ayash, the authors of Broken Bonds, uh, and Elizabeth Nugent, a political scientist at Princeton University. You can find all the, uh, the, the text of the book, uh, as well as a fantastic podcast series at the Century Foundation's website, tcf.org. Uh, you can also find a recording of this session, which will be posted shortly after we conclude. I'd like to thank everyone who joined today. I'd like to thank Mark, uh, president of the Century Foundation and uh, TCF for supporting this work, uh, and all of you uh, who showed up today to listen to our authors and our respondent uh, talk about the Muslim Brotherhood since 2013 and uh, the, uh, the new book, Broken Bonds. Thank you all uh, so much. Great to see everyone and talk to you today.